In the richest nation in the world, our children's well-being, measured across multiple dimensions, ranks 19th out of 20 rich nations. Why that is and what we can do about it matters. To this child, to all of our children, and to the future of our society. We talk a good game in this country about being family friendly. But in providing for the economic and social needs of families, we are woefully behind other countries. Want to show Daddy a book? In today's day, we all got to work. And there's, I can remember back in like my grandfather's days, you know, the men work, the lady, the woman stay home and take care of the house and, you know, family, thing like that. In today's day, it surely can't happen. Everybody got to go out and work and, you know what I'm saying, bring it in. Very good. Yeah, you're going to show Daddy Yeah, he works a split Very shift. Good. So, like, two in the afternoon to one, two in the morning. Yeah. I'm on nice this week. And so the next week, though, I'll be on days. Americans now work more hours than every other rich nation, yet the middle class is shrinking. Social mobility is less than it was 50 years ago. And most damning, one in four of our children is born into poverty. David, you know, tomorrow's a really hectic day. I have a training. I have to be there at 9 o'clock. 70% of our children are growing up in families headed by working parents. I, I bring work home with me, and it's not required. Um, it's just what I do so that I don't feel as overwhelmed. Things just barely work out. Like feeling security, I don't know, I don't, know, I don't really know what that feels like to feel like, all right, <laughs> we're good. you silly girl. I wake up in the morning and I'm on. It's like, where's my other child? And then I go to work and I'm on. You have a good day, little one. And then I come home and then I'm on until the kids go to sleep. There's four different places that everyone needs to be in. It's too much. I can't do it. Our policies actually actively discourage parents from being able to take care of those kids well in their prenatal months, in their early years, and getting them ready for school. Among the world's richest nations, the United States is the only country that fails to provide guaranteed paid maternal leave on the birth of a child. It took nine years to get unpaid leave. That's disgusting. Forty percent of all American mothers are working within three months of their baby's birth. Some because they want to, most because they have to. Our child care expenses now that we have a second child, it's way more than we spend on our mortgage. Among rich nations, our child care ranks 16th in affordability, 22nd in quality. I picked him up one day and I went to change him and his bum was bleeding. So we, we left there right, right at that point. We rank 31st in availability of childcare. So this is our wait list, and this is the wait list just for infants and toddlers. If I'm not there, I'm, I'm entrusting someone else to keep her safe, to teach her, to help her grow in all areas, developmentally, spiritually, Mama. because we can't do it alone, you know. Once you imagine that every family stands on its own, you're really making it impossible to create a national vision of everyone doing well together. A lot of us buy into this idea that a parent is the one responsible for their child's development and their outcomes. Go ahead, Lily. What are you thankful for? My mommy and my daddy. But let's just step back for a moment and just look at what exactly the reality is for a child. So you have a child who's an individual with their biology and their genetics and their personality characteristics. And they're nested in their family 
their peers, their, their close social relationships. But that is nested within another level, which is your school, your community institutions, your neighborhood. And that level is nested within our culture, our laws, our policies, our social structures, our systems. As a society, where do we see the role of our policies? Isn't part of that role to help children to grow and develop? The business community of the United States has always shaped the big policy priorities of the country, the big political priorities of the country. The lobbying power of the next generation is next to nil. And as a consequence, our society steadily and relentlessly underinvests in kids. We shouldn't be surprised if so many of our children arrive at kindergarten unready to begin school. And we shouldn't be surprised that so many of our kids can't graduate from high school. In 1970, the United States was number one in the world in high school and college graduation rates. Today, we've fallen to 15th in college completion, 21st in high school graduation. High school graduation rate, we know, is strongly related to things that occur long before high school. Can you write your name? My name starts with an A. There's your A. So reading in third grade, the reading level is a strong predictor of whether or not you're going to graduate from high school. Well, what predicts reading in third grade? Mama! Yes, we are. Oh, the are. number of words you know when you're between the ages yeah. of two and three. Oh, so what predicts the number of words you know when you're two or three years old? Are you happy? So we can keep tracking back. Can see the doctor? Beginning from the moment of birth, 700 new synapses are being formed every single second in all parts of the brain that basically become the, the architecture and the foundation of who we are as people. We know that effect, but this, so they took away nesting material. Exciting new neuroscience research makes it clear. Early experiences get under our baby's skin and can alter the wiring of their developing brains for better or for worse. You can see these processes in mice. You can see these processes in monkeys um, and in the human data, too, in, in young kids. Very few of us remember what we experienced when we were babies or toddlers. But the brain remembers. The body remembers. At a biological level, how does something that happens to you so early in life stick with you, persist forever, for, for, for a lifetime? <laughs> Everything kind of starts from the bottom up. If we don't do it right early, it's harder later. We pay more for it later, and we don't get as good an outcome. The evidence is in. When we increase the time, income, and resources for parents and caregivers of young children, we help build a solid foundation for lifelong development, better learning, earning, and physical and mental health. Not just one study, there are actually four independent longitudinal studies on early ed, all getting very, very high annual rates of return. Most of these benefits are public benefits. All right, so what other sounds does animals make? The part of this argument that I like the most is the social equality aspect of it. What's socially fair is also economically efficient. So if you were a government or somebody asking, where should I put my money? In the stock market or in a young child? You'd say, in a young child. Because you're going to get a bigger payback in terms of earnings in a child, in terms of reduced crime, reduced incarceration, reduced litany of social problems. If you would ask, you know, what really matters for kids when they're very young? I mean, what do we all want for our children? We want them to be happy and healthy and thriving. We want them to be growing and learning and being all they can be. 
This is a, a core value that we all share. The problem is that, that we don't all share a commitment to that for everybody's kids. Fox and Socks, our game is done. Sir. There's never been a societal problem or issue where we have had so much information and done so little with it. Between the neuroscience and the economic literature, and there's just this explosion of, of information that no one is disputing, but we're still not acting on it. Okay, you want me to give you a hug? You need a hug right now? We don't just have an achievement gap in, in this country, we have a policy gap. We need to be investing in the early years.